Um, if I may, let me say for, uh, for the record that this is an oral history uh, with members of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee at NIH, NIMH from the late 1960s and early 1970s uh, and other people involved in um, NIH at that time to discuss the activities of this group in opposing the Vietnam War. The interview is being videotaped and audio taped on December 9th, 2005 in conference room 10 of the building 31C, 6th floor conference center. Uh, I am the interviewer and moderator. I am Victoria Hardin, the director of the Office of NIH History. Now, to begin with, and welcome to everybody, um, I would like to go around the room and ask each person just to state your name and very briefly um, say what year you came to NIH, uh, if you were at NIH, and to describe what sort of work you were doing at NIH during the period we're discussing. Chaplain White, you want to start and we'll go around. Oh, oh please, There's press a button in front right. of your mic. Make sure the red light is on and speak into the microphone. We'll record things properly. Oh. I'm Chaplain Bob White. Uh, I came to work at NIH at the beginning of 1961. And uh, uh, at the time, I was the Protestant chaplain uh, in the chaplain, uh, chaplain's office in the clinical center. And uh, I was that for 23 years, three months, uh, before I retired. And, but uh, during the time um, uh, of, of what was happening about uh, the war in the Vietnam, I was already an activist. I, went, I was in almost all of the uh, civil rights things that they had in Washington, D.C., and all of the things in terms of all the events related to the, the war in Vietnam. And so when this group started, I was right ready to be a part of it. I'm Zona Hostetler. I did not work at NIH, but uh, I was a lawyer and still am a lawyer. And I was asked to represent the moratorium committee when it uh, sought to have Dr. Spock speak uh, to the employees. And uh, the administration said he could not speak. We later won the case. <laughs> You later won the case. <laughs> uh, I'm Rose Mage. Uh, I came to NIH in 1963 as a postdoc and became a tenured uh, civil servant in 1965, unheard of at this time, uh, and have been here ever since, and I'm still here. I'm a section chief in the Laboratory of Immunology, where I started, and I direct a program of immunogenetics, and uh, lately we're interested in the genome sequence of the rabbit. And Mike Mage, my husband, was the person who was very active in the committee, and I played the supporting role while doing all this other stuff. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Mage. I came to NIH in 1962. In 1969, I was in the Laboratory of Biochemistry in the Cancer Institute. My lab chief was Herb Sober. My section chief was Al Peterson and I was working on developing methods for cell separation. Um, I'm Marianne Ross, also in a supporting role to Phil Ross to my left. Um, I was very involved in the um, committee, though, mostly in the pre preparation of the visuals, the armbands, the posters, the banners, and so on. I'm Phil Ross. Uh, I came to NIH in 1961. I was a research scientist at what was then called the Arthritis Institute. I'm uh, Carl Leventhal. I joined NIH in 1964 and uh, retired in uh, 1996. Um, during the period in question, I, was, uh, I went to work in the office of the director in 1968 and actually left there in 1974. Um, I was uh, by title first the, uh, uh, I guess I was originally called the assistant to the director of laboratories and clinics and then later the assistant to the deputy director for science 
and uh, my position was one of sort of liaison and communication with the scientific directors and the intramural programs of the institutes and the working scientists of the institutes. And uh, kind of by default, I uh, became the uh, liaison to the uh, moratorium committee when we began uh, to, uh, after Zona's work, to uh, accept and, and agree with the scheduling and planning of uh, meetings and rallies and other things. And uh, so I was kind of an intermediary between the committee and um, the security services at NIH who were not entirely happy about that assignment and uh, the audiovisual people and a variety of other things. I think generally the uh, loudspeakers work pretty well at the hey, meetings. Um, I'm Martin Blumsack. Uh, Marty. I came to NIH in 1968 uh, as a management intern. I'm still here. Uh, I administer uh, some research grant programs. And uh, back during the time of the moratorium committee, I was just in a variety of ad administrative jobs, all involved in the grant part of NIH. Um, I came here in 68 when I got out of the Army. Um, I had uh, organized, uh, actually, I think the first anti-war um, demonstration on a military base and while I was in, and I was in the Vietnam Veterans uh, Against the War, Veterans for Peace, and uh, came out and uh, found the Federal Employees for Peace and, and then found the uh, Moratorium Committee. I'm David Reese. Uh, I came to the intramural portion of NIMH in 1966 as a clinical associate and as um, part of my service obligation instead of uh, serving in the, uh, in the military. I came as a commissioned officer in the public health service. I became a section chief and a branch chief. and. Uh, left NIH in 1974 uh, under circumstances that might be interesting to try to reconstruct in the course of, of the morning. I'm Stephanie Weldon. I came to NIH in 1968 as a management intern, and it's all his fault that I got involved in the anti-war movement. Marty and I were interns together. Having just graduated from Georgetown University, the only safe place in Washington, D.C., if you supported the war in Vietnam, and so I knew nothing. Came to NIH, did a number of um, rotations as an intern, and um, ultimately finished with being in the Office of, of Personnel in Training and Employee Development, and just followed in Marty's radical footsteps and uh, have never regretted a moment of it, Marty. <laughs> I'm uh, Natasha Rettig. In uh, 1965, I came to work at the National Institute of Mental Health as a social science analyst, um, research assistant uh, in the Psychopharmacology Research Center, as it was then, uh, or Psychopharmacology Service Center. <laughs> It's now taken over all of psychiatry. Um, I also was active in uh, developing um, the Federal Employees for Peace, which worked uh, parallel to and closely with um, the uh, Vietnam Moratorium Committee, and also we established um, a League of Federal Voters in order to have another venue to voice um, concerns during the 1972 or 74 elections, I really don't remember. Um, but we'll get to that in the course of these deliberations. Thank you. Hi, I'm Madeline Gold, and I came to the, um, to the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in 1967 and um, very quickly got involved in federal employees for peace against the federal employees against the war in Vietnam, um, which we'll go into more detail. This involved a petition drive, which was really the first initiating activity around peace uh, within the federal government. And then um, we moved into organizing um, federal employees for a democratic society, 
and then um, was one of the founders also and leaders of the Federal Employees for Peace. Uh, I'm really here also for my husband, Norman Oslik, who couldn't be here today, wanted so desperately to be here, um, but was a um, worked at the National Cancer Institute and was active in the, in the moratorium committee, which was a very defining experience for him, the whole, the, the whole activity. And um, so I'm delighted to be here, to be with everybody. I'm Irene Elkin. I was Irene Wasco back in those days. Uh, and I first came, I realize I'm, I'm the grandmother here because I came before anybody else. I came uh, to the intramural program to the Laboratory of Psychology as a postdoc in 1959. And then from 1962 on, I was in extra, uh, extramural NIMH as a research psychologist, first in psychopharmacology research branch, then in the clinical research branch. I'm primarily a psychotherapy researcher. And I retired early from NIMH uh, in 1990 and joined the faculty of the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm now emerita, but still working a lot and politically active. And, and being the oldest makes me uh, say that the first political activity or one of the first things I became involved in was at the University of Wisconsin as an undergraduate. I was part of the Joe Must Go campaign, which was an effort to recall Joseph McCarthy. <laughs> so I go <laughs> way back. <laughs> Um, Robert Martin, I guess uh, you do predate me. I, 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 I didn't get here until uh, February of 1960, uh, and I'm still here. Uh, I was in what was then called National Institute of Arthritis and Metabolic Diseases, and it has gone through multiple name changes so that uh, I forget. Recent memory is gone. I don't know what it's called now. Um, and uh, uh, I'm still here and working, and uh, uh, got involved in this, and uh, Lee Rosner, who unfortunately uh, hasn't been able to make it out today, uh, reminded me that this is probably the first organization that led to uh, political activity and a whole number of things that followed thereafter, like the uh, committee to help the janitors uh, uh, pay scale and the committee to uh, uh, for the um, what was it, upward mobility program for the uh, University of the District of Columbia. Uh, programs that were done here, um, and that's it. I'm Mark Leventhal. Um, I came here in uh, 1968 uh, to work in uh, Bob Martin's section. I had, was um, in, uh, before I came here, I was at Johns Hopkins University as a postdoc where I was um, involved in uh, civil rights activities with the uh, Congress of Racial Equality, and I came here, and I have to say that um, looking at looking through uh, uh, the records, that uh, uh, Bob's section was a hotbed of uh, <laughs> radical activities, <laughs> and uh, um, in, uh, I left um, the NIH in uh, 1972. Was uh, uh, exiled to the Midwest, pursued by um, uh, some criminals in the Nixon administration and denied a job at um, Ohio State, and so uh, ended up at uh, Purdue University, uh, where I still am, but will be retired at the end of this year. I'm John Zinner. I'm a psychiatrist. Like David Reese, I came uh, from the same training program to the intramural research program at NIMH in 1966. And uh, as with David, I was fulfilling my military obligation as a commissioned officer in the public health service. I worked in the section on personality development in the adult psychiatry branch as a clinical associate, then became the head of family studies unit in that section. And we were studying there uh, interaction um, in family members of late adolescents who broke down emotionally when they were leaving home, going off to college. Uh, we were almost late adolescents ourselves at that time. Uh, subsequently, uh, I left NIMH in 1973, and uh, now I'm in private practice and do a lot of teaching at GW of psychiatric residents.
Schiffman. I'm sorry. Press the button. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Elliot Schiffman. I'm sorry. I'm a bit late, but I was looking for Victoria's Secret, and I guess I found it. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I came to NIH uh, in 1956, and I was in the Heart Institute uh, right after I got my PhD in biochemistry from Columbia. I continued in the Heart Institute until about, uh, uh, I think, uh, early 1960s until I went to the Dental Institute. And there I became radicalized after meeting uh, Ed Rosamondo, who some of you may remember. He, and. Uh, I um, <coughs> was very much concerned uh, with uh, some of the problems with the United States being in the, the war in Vietnam, or the actual war in Indochina. And uh, I and uh, Mike Mage and others, uh, certainly around the table, participated in uh, organizing and carrying on the Vietnam Moratorium Committee. Uh, since then, uh, I have stayed at NIH. I am now in the Cancer Institute, and I am a scientist emeritus, which means that I float around and bother people with impunity, but I don't get paid for it. And the, <laughs> and the trade off is sometimes worth it, too, actually. Uh, in any event, uh, um, uh, some of my colleagues and I are very much concerned with uh, the present administration and its uh, adventures in, the, uh, in a certain part of the world. And we, I, I certainly have the same feelings about what's going on uh, as I did have uh, during the Vietnam War. And uh, I certainly am very happy to, uh, to be uh, around some of the people that I love and admire. And uh, I, I really feel good about being here. Thank you. Audrey Stone. Audrey Stone. <clears throat> I came to NIH in 1959 and uh, uh, joined the um, staff at the National Institute of Mental Health. I was really not uh, very highly active in the formation and in the um, ideas and um, creation of the uh, NIMH, NIH Moratorium Committee. But I was really part of it by heart and action. I did the, I, I joined um, the, the committee and I worked with others um, uh, distributing the, the, um, the leaflets and getting people interested and activated uh, toward action against the Vietnam War. So I've always been very grateful to the people, David and John, for having given us the opportunity here to, to uh, uphold the dignity of, uh, of our country and times when it was pretty ugly. And um, uh, one of the things that I might comment, and it had effect on family because uh, we, uh, a number of us, of course, had young children, and this gave them the opportunity to see democracy really working, freedom of speech and the necessity to keep active in activities that uh, maintained the ideals of this country. Thank you all. Um, I would like to ask one more background question. Everybody doesn't have to answer, but perhaps uh, a few of you will speak to this. Uh, I'm always interested in how people get involved in things and whether you came out of a family of activists uh, or if there was a teacher or minister or some other person who inspired you to get involved in things like this, what made you do it and not other people? Would several of you want to respond to that? And please don't forget, say your name. Mark Leventhal, I'd like to respond to that because uh, I came um, actually from a uh, very conservative uh, uh, middle class, low working class, Jewish background in Brooklyn. But uh, my grandfather was a um, dedicated Trotskyite, had known Leon Trotsky, and at a very early age uh, took me to uh, uh, Parks on 14th Street to uh, meet uh, 
and here members of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade who fought in the Spanish Civil War, so that uh, uh, everything I have done, and I also named my son after uh, 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 my uh, grandfather is uh, inspired by his early teachings to a five and six year old. Uh, Martin Blumsack. Um, I also came from a rather, I wouldn't say conservative, but certainly in no way politically active middle class Jewish family in Chicago. My grandmother Sarah, however, um, was very active uh, in the early 1900s. There was a, a rather large social action uh, undercurrent in the, in the Jewish community. And she was active uh, in upholding workers' rights. Um, my grandfather, great grandfather, couldn't figure out why his employees were able to strike so long. Didn't they get hungry? But my grandmother was sneaking food out to them. <laughs> um, so no, my grandma passed away when I was when I was young, and there was none of it in my family. I'm not quite sure it happened, but of course I grew up in the 50s, and I got involved in. Um, uh, unions and in protesting the House Un-American Activities Committee and f just freedom of speech in the school. And, um, and from there, it was on to Students for Democratic Society. Um, I was in the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. And um, I gave up my student deferment uh, because I felt that, well, some per some kid in the ghetto was going to be drafted. And that was because so many of us who were in the middle class were able to avoid serving. And then I went into the Army and uh, did anti-war organizing in the Army and uh, demonstrations. And then from that to the veterans against the war, Vietnam veterans against the war, um, you know, throwing medals over the fence and stuff. Came to NIH uh, when I got out of the Army. and. Uh, found Federal Employees for Peace, and that led to the other people who were starting the committee here. So the last thing I want to say very clearly is this. One of the big memories I have of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee here, and I mentioned it earlier, is that we're part of a, a history and a process of, of social activism. And in fact, uh, one of my proud memories is that when the committee voted to um, call for the impeachment of the president, although a majority were in favor, we didn't pursue it because we didn't want to alienate the members of our committee who couldn't go that far. What we did, we had a different person in charge every month, and what we did is we welcomed and we brought along people who had never been active before and after we stopped, those people went on into the women's movement, into the environmental movement, here at NIH working for social causes. And so I think one of the really outstanding things about our committee was the way we treated everybody. Everybody was treated with respect, everybody was welcome, and everybody was taught a little bit the way we like them to go. But I think we were just an amazing group for that purpose, as diverse as we were. I'd like to answer that as well, Stephanie Weldon. Um, I remember my grandmother, who was born in 1900, telling the story of hiding her brother in a cupboard behind a wall in Odessa to keep him from being drafted into the Tsar's army so that I realized that my roots of being against the war and against the military go back a long, long way. Uh, but I remember walking to school one morning on election day in 1952 with my mother, and all I'd ever heard was Eisenhower, Eisenhower, and she was voting for Stevenson, and I threatened to misbehave if she didn't vote for Eisenhower. She didn't take my threat seriously. 1964, when I graduated from high school, I worked up on Capitol Hill for a Connecticut senator. That was Freedom Summer. And I made the mistake in an elevator 
in, on the old Senate office building of criticizing um, lynching in Mississippi and saying, I didn't think it was an appropriate way of life that should be protected. I found out the next day that standing behind me was the most powerful man in the United States Senate who had spent the rest of the day trying to find out who this 17-year-old was to get fired, Senator James Eastland. Uh, my senator just wryly said, keep your mouth shut in the elevator. So it, it went on. There's a long history of that. But I, I don't know that it was necessarily conscious or just something in the family that you grow up with, justice, justice shall ye pursue. And, you know, it's in our genes. I just wanted to say something on a different line, which is I'm enormously impressed as a grandparent, and I suppose most of the people around the table nowadays are grandparents, at how everybody remembers the influence of their grandparents. And I, I hope we can do the same thing for our grandchildren. Uh, I wanted to say something that was, oh, I'm sorry, Irene Elkin. Uh, that was stimulated by um, uh, Stephanie's mentioning uh, Stevenson. Because I grew up in a family that was not at all activist. And I've tried to figure out where did mine come from. But one of the um, things that, that really influenced me a lot early on in my undergraduate years <coughs> was hearing Adlai Stevenson speak at the University of Wisconsin. And I found him so inspiring and went right down to Democratic headquarters and started licking envelopes for Adlai Stevenson. And that was my first really active uh, active thing politically. But since Marty brought up something about the group in general, and I'm glad, I'm sure we're going to say much more about it, but I wanted to add one thing. I thought what you said was terrific. I wanted to add one more thing, that we were such an incredibly non-sexist <coughs> and non-hierarchical group. And at the 79 reunion party at my house, uh, people started giving testimonials. I wish we'd recorded that. Started giving testimonials to that. You didn't know if somebody was a lab chief or a secretary. Uh, and it was one of the really beautiful things about this group, uh, that, that it had that quality. Everybody was in it together. Hi, Madeline Gold. And I just wanted to say, um, I also um, was brought up in a family that was not an activist family. And uh, although they, are, they were very left-leaning, and I can't remember the exact moment you know, when, when this actually, where, where my own politics arrived from. But I will say that um, I, went to, um, I went to social work school at, you know, in the, in the early 60s when there was, the civil rights movement was really um, starting off, and, I mean, really in full swing, but, you know, really getting going. And I think there was a lot of, for a lot of us, there was the kind of uh, subject to the, the radicalism that was happening in the time, and then the poverty program. I became a community organizer, um, and so I was involved in a, working in a lot of low-income communities where you, I saw every day the, you know, the tremendous inequities and injustices. And um, I think that that was certainly very much, um, I think, for a lot of people, the um, shaping of a, a politics and a mindset that saw then the injustices and the horrendous, you know, the horrendousness of the, you know, Vietnam War. Uh, Phil Ross, uh, my uncle was one of 20 conscientious objectors in World War I in England, and he went to jail for his beliefs, uh, so that we have a long tradition of dissent in our family. Um, uh, in college, I went to college in the uh, undergraduate school in the height of the McCarthy era, and I devoted my activities, or apart from learning, uh, extracurricularly, uh, inviting speakers uh, to the campus to talk about uh, speakers who were being suppressed and not heard. So I have a great concern for academic freedom. Uh, after that, I was active in civil rights movement demonstrations and uh, uh, active uh, helped uh, put together the uh, national teach-in in the war against against the war in Vietnam in the uh, spring of 1965. And uh, was also active uh, in the community uh, in opposing the war. And so when uh, these events came here at NIH, it was a natural fusion of anti-war activity and uh, my concerns for academic freedom uh, to uh, join in this group.
I'm Mike Mage. Uh, my family was non-political, or if they were, they kept it secret from me and my brothers. <laughs> um, but I went to the High School of Music and Art in the late 1940s in New York City. And a lot of the students there were political, and they were very interested, and I joined them in being interested in the campaign for Henry Wallace for president in 1948. And I still remember some of the songs they used to sing, like, the Republicans, they <laughs> grieve me. The Democrats, they only deceive me. We need a brand new party, believe me. As we go rolling out the boat, roll it out for Wallace, roll it up for Taylor, roll it up for Vito Marcantonio. Happy is the day when the people get their way as we go rolling up the vote. <laughs> I think <laughs> I, I'm, I'm Mike's wife, Rose, and I just want to say two very brief things. One is that I married Mike very young, so I was influenced by his radicalism. But I also um, have an intellectual father who was my PhD advisor, and his name was Elvin Cabot. He subsequently was a Fogarty scholar here, but during the time I was in uh, his laboratory, he wouldn't allow anybody to have any association with NIH, and that was because NIH had cut off his grants during the McCarthy period. And uh, so I think he radicalized me. He was very politically active, and as my intellectual father, I learned immunochemistry from him, but I also learned uh, something about uh, protest. Uh, I'd like to mention, uh, uh, my name, it's Elliot Schiffman, and uh, one person I remember who really gave me a certain amount of insight was a uh, history instructor. And uh, at that time, uh, he simply didn't uh, record dates and names, but he urged us to look into some of the causes and movements that, uh, that history is awash with, and I think this uh, generated a certain amount of critical faculty in me. And as far as a uh, particular incident uh, with my uh, uh, Vietnam uh, moratorium committee experience, uh, a number of us went down to uh, a protest. There were so many of them going on. And uh, we uh, agreed to uh, be arrested in front of the White House. And uh, some of us were because we lay down in front of the White House. And we were arrested for, and I quote, incommoding the pavement. <laughs> <laughs> we spent a, uh, or I spent a night in the uh, central cell block, and uh, I was released on my own recognizance uh, afterwards, and I think the charges were dropped, but I've never followed up. But anyway, I, I, I went there as a representative of the VNMC, and I thought that was a, uh, a really uh, a gratifying uh, experience. Uh, I, I can't. Bob White. Um, I was in the Army in World War II, and uh, I was, uh, because I had worked at Duke Hospital as a pharmacist assistant, uh, they, the eighth day I was in the Army, when I was drafted, they put me in the pharmacy at Moore General Hospital, and that was a, a new hospital, 3,000 bed, and uh, uh, of the, uh, the, the patients from North African invasion, uh, Walter Reed, we got half of them, and we would get, ha get half of them, so we had to get it set up. Uh, the thing is that uh, really um, did something to me is the pharmacy door, or, or the window, was right on a main corridor, and when they brought ships, the, the patients in, uh, many of them in cast, and their arms up like that, or their legs or something, and the sad look on so many things it got it to us. And uh, uh, I think that uh, it made me feel very sensitive about what happens to these people. The pharmacist who worked with me uh, and the, the pharmacy technician handbook had just graduated from University of North Carolina School of Pharmacy, and he was not uh, one B like I was because I was skinny, he ended up 
end the Battle of the Bones. We didn't know that until after he got out of it and he wrote us that that happened. But the thing is, the, the sense of uh, anxiety and, and um, feeling for people who are in the uh, service uh, is that's something that stuck with me. And uh, uh, what I do now is uh, uh, I went to University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and they're very uh, interested in fighting for things like that. And that's when I got in to uh, uh, trying to take a stand. Uh, but now what I do is uh, I watch uh, Jim Lero uh, and, and when he ends up each, each meeting, most of each, each, each program, uh, names and pictures of people who've died in Iraq. And I feel just like I did uh, when I was a member of this group. I just wanted to mention a couple, John Zinner, I wanted to mention a couple of other activities that in terms of background that preceded uh, the anti-war movement that involved uh, physicians and scientists and others support people at NIH and NIMH. And that was one, uh, and I think it was under the uh, banner of the Medical Committee for Human Rights at that time, David. And that was uh, that a, a bunch of us first uh, provided uh, medical and psychiatric services for Resurrection City, if you remember Resurrection City coming down to Washington. And that was really quite exciting and, and difficult work. And also uh, a number of us provided services uh, to those who'd been swept off the street and arrested during the riots that followed the assassination of Martin Luther King. All these preceded the, our uh, Vietnam Moratorium Committee, but there was a lot of activity at that time. And I'd mentioned to Victoria that uh, in terms of the differences in the whole culture of the administration, when we came down here in 1966, clinical associates were encouraged to leave their positions for brief periods to go down south to monitor the effectiveness of desegregation in hospital wards. So they were going over the records and the uh, demography of the hospital wards down in the south to see to what extent uh, desegregation was actually being uh, carried out. And this was something that was not only condoned by the administration, but it was actually arranged and encouraged. Quite a difference. Um, I would like to follow up on that, uh, and then we'll, we'll back if I may. I just I wanted to hear from more people in the Associates Training Program uh, about coming to NIH, uh, whether it was a conscious decision on your part to try to stay out of, of the military, uh, whether uh, what kinds of activities you might have been involved in, which you've already discussed uh, to some extent. Uh, but just to expand a bit on that, and then we'll come back uh, and finish this uh, preliminary conversations. Would some of you who were clinical associates uh, or research associates comment? David Reese, um, I think the motivation for becoming a clinical associate was complicated. Obviously, NIH was a wonderful place for physicians who didn't get much research training. In contrast to PhDs who got a lot, we really got none. We, we went very much to a trade school. Uh, and if we were interested in research, coming to NIH was uh, a marvelous opportunity to learn by doing. And I certainly got my research career started here, and I continued in full-time research to this, to this moment. But, but it is surely true that the uh, draft was staring us in the face, and I didn't have the courage that Marty did, frankly. And I, uh, I, uh, I had forgotten that story, Marty, and I'm, I'm just moved by it, as I am by, by what many people have said. Uh, but uh, uh, we got... Um, our military service uh, satisfied by by coming here, and we called ourselves the Yellow Berets. Uh, I think with acknowledgement. Can Can you tell me when the Yellow Berets started? When that term started. Started. I don't know. It was certainly in force uh, for the entire time I was a clinical associate. And I became a little after the song about the Green Berets because that was the beginning of berets in the army. There was a song about the Yellow Berets, and that's why we're, we've been trying to pin down whether this was something you all 
uh, developed yourself or whether it came out of one of the songs. I In could add a comment about that. Uh, the draft was all, it was part of, uh, I'm Mike Mage, was part of our background. It was there all the time. When I started college in 1951, the Korean War was going on. I joined ROTC because that way I would at least be able to finish my four years of college and I would go in as an officer. And I did four years and I was commissioned in the artillery, but then uh, I went to dental school at Columbia and they deferred me for that. But then I got interested in research and I did a postdoc and I, then I had the opportunity to come to NIH also in the public health service where I served for 30 years. So it was always there and in the back of your mind it influenced or channeled your decisions at every step. I just I want to say one quickly. No, David. Oh, Marty Blumsack. Um, I happen to be at a particular place in my life with a particular set of circumstances at the time that I made my decision. You can't draw uh, comparisons between us. Remember the, the motto, it's, it's one struggle, many fronts. And everyone did what was appropriate for them in their life at that time. Um, we can't start, there, there is, no, you know, yeah, I'm sorry, it's not like, well, you were brave and I wasn't, or you, you were here a month before I was. Um, we, we all did what we could do, given who we were and where we were in our lives and in our environment. And the one thing we never did then, and we're sure not going to start doing now, is trying to think that anybody somehow is different than anybody else in terms of their commitment or their value. Uh, you, I have admired you from the beginning of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee at NIH, and I refuse to even consider <laughs> anything that would suggest otherwise. That's it. Um, I was also a Yellow Beret, but I came here in 60 before. It was a major concern. In fact, I came to Washington because uh, uh, my wife had a job, $29 a week take home, uh, the Washington Post, and so that influenced my decision to come to the NIH much more than uh, any other uh, event. Uh, Phil Ross, I'd just like to comment that I believe the great number of these uh, medical people down at the NIH who are so-called yellow berets uh, helped this committee because we had the, the labs were just full of these uh, folk and so it created a, uh, a <laughs> fertile environment f f in which the Vietnam Moratorium Committee could operate. One, one, one more background statement, no? We have, we, have we have a new person. Would you introduce yourself? Would you introduce yourself and say who? What you were doing in the 60s when this group was acting. Do I have to mention anything illegal? <laughs> <laughs> Only um, if you want to. I'm Robert Ryder, and uh, hi, Dave. Hi, Bob. And um, I worked here from 61 to 74, came in with Kennedy, left with Nixon. It was a good time. The departure was a good time, anyway. And um, I guess I did what we all did during those years. You know, hi, Marty. You look different. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly what you would like me to say in addition to that. I can, I can tell you what my, uh, what my favorite experience was during the moratorium activities. That would, be, that would be fun. That was the day that somebody in the administration told me that we would not be permitted to have Ted Kennedy come and talk. And... Uh, I remember I made a phone call to Ted Kennedy's senatorial office, and then I just sort of sat back and waited. And along about the middle of lunchtime, I got a call from Robert Q. Marston saying, 
Hi, Bob. Uh, <laughs> I think we can do something here. And uh, it all happened. That was such a, such a pleasant moment. <laughs> all right. I would like to move into the beginning of the organized uh, group. Uh, let me just set the stage a little bit. Uh, there are many dates that we could use to talk about the beginning of the Vietnam War. Um, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution is one of the big dates, and this group was not organized then. Uh, my sense from reading the material that you've sent is that you all organized in 1969, and one of my questions here is why then? What happened in 1969? And then it appears to me that the first major event was uh, the, the talk that Dr. Spock gave uh, on our children's needs, the war, and the right to dissent. And I would like some of you to walk me through how the group organized and what initially happened. Like Please. Say yeah, Mark Leventhal. I'd like to, um, uh, I, I collected uh, uh, some uh, memos that we had done for the his, and um, as, far as, as far as I know, the first uh, published statement to this group was the policy statement for the October 15th activities. And I'd like to, I'm not going to read it all, but I'd like to read one paragraph from it, uh, which I think we could uh, endorse today. To bring this bloodbath to a halt, we call for an immediate end to American participation in the war. We call for a reordering of national priorities to provide adequate food, housing, and health for all Americans. This statement was signed by the Vietnam Moratorium Committee at NIH, NIMH, and these are the names in alphabetical order, which is an example of the uh, way this organization was ran. I'd like to read those names. Martin Blumsack, Robert F. Goldberger, Mark Leventhal, Robert G. Martin, David Reese, Judah L. Rosner, Philip D. Ross, Stephanie, S uh, Robert G. Ryder, Stephanie Singer, Irene Waskow, Jen Ye, and John Zinner. I might just uh, insert here, I have Zona Hostetler. Uh, Bob Goldberger, who was at the Cancer Institute, uh, is no longer living. Uh, but when he died, his family uh, called me because they said he, want, they, he always thought that the most significant thing he did in life was uh, to work with the Vietnam uh, Moratorium Committee and, to, um, and that when he died, he hoped that his obituary stress that, and in fact, it did. Let's talk for a minute about the legal proceedings uh, to, to get to this point. John, did you want to say something first? Just an answer to your question. In answer to your question, John Zinner, uh, in the paper that Mark gave me, it says, we hope that the national moratorium on the war will demonstrate the Nixon administration public displeasure with its policies in Vietnam. And I think that probably our organizing was stimulated by the moratorium that was taking place at that time. I don't remember the Absolutely. exact dates. But, yeah. So I think that's what probably triggered our, our participation, mm -hmm. that there was a national right. moratorium right at that time. David has an idea. About yeah, I think, uh, David Reese, I think that in terms of drawing historical lessons from our experience on this it's a recollection of my own, but I suspect it will be confirmed. When you fight a federal government as powerful and as um, replete with devices to suppress, uh, suppress uh, dissent, and we're in a situation quite comparable today, I don't think that it's fair to underestimate how frightening and how daunting and maybe just how completely discouraging it is to mount such an effort and how crucial it is to have an organizing concept with which you can make contact 
with people who have similar feelings. The moratorium concept was very novel because it's very important to remember what moratorium meant. What was the mora in the moratorium? It was to stop work. It was to not work on October 15, 1969. It was to not do what you would ordinarily do. And for those of us who had been struggling against this war for years, it just, it was a simple idea, but oddly, instead of doing something, you were gonna not do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the idea, I think, that made everybody around this table say, hey, we work for the federal government whose policies we can't stand. We're gonna stop working, we're gonna do something different. One of the early memos um, that I have in my files from uh, Zona Hostetler <laughs> from the uh, moratorium committee was why have Dr. Spock speak on March 15th? And, uh, and then the committee answered its own questions. In our view, Dr. Spock is unique among all the country's physicians and health scientists. More than any other, he has been able to transform his physician's compassion for human suffering into meaningful and effective protest against the war. We believe that by joining us on October 15th, Dr. Spock will stimulate many of his colleagues in the health field to become meaningfully involved in this protest. Well, well go ahead and then Yeah, we'll if come you back. wanted some, I can give you some of the, you got some of the eloquence from David, which we always had from David. Thanks. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but if, oh, I'm sorry, Irene Elkin. But uh, in terms of dates, somebody had gotten this statement of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee together, which said that our first meeting was on September 23rd, first meeting held to plan Vietnam mat uh, Moratorium Day activities. If my memory's correct, tell me it was Mark and David who mostly called that meeting and got in touch with most of us. Is that right? Yeah? Uh, and then it goes on, and I will get, leave this with you, uh, the Inter-Assembly Council of Scientists of the NIH voted to endorse our activities two days later, on the 25th of September. Dr. Spock, on the 26th, accepted our invitation to speak on October 15th. Uh, and uh, the use of the auditorium was requested, and on September 29th, the use of the auditorium was refused. By the way, one of the really interesting things about the whole thing is that if they had simply said yes, Chances were this incredible group would exactly. never right. have done oh, all of the things that we did. Yeah, exactly. But they said no. <laughs> and Zona Hostetler and the ACLU were willing to uh, support us. And so it goes. And if David and Mark and John and unfortunately Bob Goldberg is no longer here and I, I believe, were the five who met at seven, once it was quarter to seven in the morning, once quarter after seven in the morning with Dr. Marston. And our impression was that he kind of knew we were going to go further if they, he, he was told, he had to refuse the auditorium, he said. And, but he kind of knew that we were going to end up going to court. Is that, is that your memory of it too? Uh, but I do remember those memorable, very early uh, morning meetings with him. He was very cordial, although uh, he had to say no. Stephanie Weldon. Marty and I are trying to remember because, remember, this is predates email and the internet. And we can't remember how we heard about these meetings because we were not scientists. I just remember Marty saying there's a meeting in some lab. And I remember going into a small lab building I'd never been in before on the top floor in a small room. Building two. Building two, thank you. <laughs> Building two. Oh, that's where that was the hotbed of all radical activity. It's coming back. And we went and didn't know anybody there because you, know, you were all the exalted scientists and um, we were the exalted administrators. administrators right. and, and so we that's how our side of it got together because we but I have no idea how we heard. You heard there was a rumor that um, there was a meeting, I okay. think. Martin Blumsack, I probably heard because at that point the, the federal employees for peace was extant. No? Oh my goodness. Oh well then how in the world? Well Martin, 
I, th I, I think that the, the, it was there. Um, the way I got inv involved was, I guess, Mark had told me about it, and then I was on the um, intercommittee, whatever it was, for the Assembly of Scientists. Inter and uh, I mean, I think it may have been through the uh, Joint uh, Assembly of Scientists because that stuff was at least talked about, if not published. So the problem is Stephanie and I, as administrators, oh, Martin Blumsack, Stephanie and I, as administrators, had no contact with that group. And, and at that time, my activities were the, you know, the veterans against the war. And, and then the other possibility was, you know, the, the uh, moratorium committee was, was in existence around us. So perhaps we heard through some external route, someone in DuPont Circle. Right. Um, Madeline Gold, I'm, actually what existed at that time was the Federal Employees for Democratic Society. Oh, that's what it was, and, right, um, okay. And that, that was the organization that was there right. that um, Federal Employees for Peace came after, actually came in, 1970, in 1970, but they, we were organizing all over the federal government. And that's and it's part of what I wanted to say, just in Let's terms of the NIH, NIH and IMH moratorium committee is that, you know, the national moratorium started or really formed, I guess, in seven, in I have here, this is a paper I had written, in September 1969. And but and they were really putting a lot of emphasis on locally based, you know, organizations. And so NIH and IMH was one of um, the most active, but there were also moratorium committees in Department of Labor, HUD, certainly in HEW, National Bureau of Standards, OEO, um, all had also um, moratorium committees that had formed at that time. But FEDS was really right. the organization that had was trying to reach out to all over the government. That's what we heard. Chaplain White. Yes. Uh, Chaplain Bob White. Uh, Elliot Shipman had come to me and said, because you're the only member of the uh, committee that is on the staff at at the clinical center, and we want Dr. Spock to speak in the auditorium in the clinical center. Uh, maybe going through you will do something. You go over there and request. So I, I don't know that I wrote a memo. I think I did not. I think I went over uh, to uh, that, that office, Dr. Martin's office, and told them what we wanted to do. And they didn't answer me that time, said, we'll get in touch with you. And when they did, and said, no. <laughs> Uh, Elliot Schiffman, I wanted to mention something about uh, uh, an addendum to Dr. Spock's appearance. I don't know whether we uh, adopted this motto before or after, but it was pretty close in time, namely that war is unhealthy for human beings and all other living things. I, I think that was a creation of the moratorium committee, as I recall. And secondly, as far as the genesis of our efforts, I think even before the national moratorium was called. Uh, there were these teach-ins, which were, who were, where the university personnel who opposed the war would organize meetings, and I think this was this was a precursor to the national moratorium. I would like to finish up uh, talking about how we get Dr. Spock and then take a break, um, Carl. Can we move to the other side for the moment, <laughs> to, the, to Building 1, which said no, and this is what resulted. Um, you are the person who was in Building 1 at that time. Can you tell us, was the NIH administration uh, strongly opposed to this itself, or was this uh, orders coming down from the department or the White House? Uh, were you privy to any of this? And can you tell me what Regulation 44 was that, uh, on wh which basis the auditorium was denied? The answer to your last question is no. <laughs> memory, memory begins to fail, and I am afraid I, I couldn't have any idea what 43 or 45 were either. Uh, at any rate, um, I, I think let me just say a few things about, by way of background. Um, Robert Marston and uh, Robert Berliner, for whom I worked, who was the Deputy Director for Science of NIH, and a number of the other senior people who came 
to Building One, the director's office at NIH, in about 1968, um, were, uh, in the words of our later president, Mr. Nixon, in 1972, they were Johnson holdovers. They were people who'd been appointed by President Johnson um, in um, largely, uh, I would say, if I remember right, about April, May, and June, uh, pretty much most of that top staff of NIH, of 1968. So it was um, just shortly before the election uh, when uh, Nixon became president, and there was a great deal of uncertainty about the um, potential for what I think everyone has called in succeeding years politicalization of the NIH in terms of to what extent would partisan approval, partisan clearance uh, be a necessity of appointments at NIH and to what level those would be. Um, it, it was really at a time when at least a little naively, people believed even that the director of NIH was not a political appointee. The, the history would show otherwise in individual and personal terms. The great James Shannon himself was an extremely uh, political appointee, but it was not, in fact, um, in the technical sense, a presidential appointment, which it later became in 1971 or 72 with the passage of the National Cancer Act. So that I think that um, the degree to which people uh, in the top staff of NIH felt that they had to operate in sort of lockstep with administration, administration policy, uh, was very hard to interpret. This was all pretty new to NIH to have um, concerns or, um, or political activities that were really outside of what we considered the mission of NIH, outside of biomedical research, despite the scientists and physicians against the war and all of that. Let me just say at the same time, however, that um, I know from personal knowledge that most of the people who were involved in the decision making were Democrats. They were people who were very unhappy with the election of the president, and they were people who were very much in sympathy uh, with the movement uh, itself and with the protest against the war. When there were large numbers of students who came to Washington from uh, universities as part of the early uh, moratorium, many of these very same people uh, had students sleeping on sleeping bags in their basements and boarding in their houses and so on. Um, my own impression, and obviously everyone has their own hero worship, is that really the idea of saying to Dr. Reese, well, why don't you just go ahead and sue us, was actually Dr. Marston's idea originally. <laughs> I don't know who gets the credit for it, and uh, I'm sure Zora has a lot more to say about that, but, but in fact, uh, we did feel, and I, I was involved in discussions that felt that this was the right way to go at it. And uh, the eventual Reese versus Finch uh, suit uh, was, um, when it was uh, successful, was greeted with, with great uh, happiness in the director's office of NIH. We liked being told what to do. <laughs> Just to add a corroborating detail, David Reese, Carl, you may not remember this. Um, we got word on the suit, um, I would say, if I had to guess, 3 or 3.30 th p.m. on October 14th, and we're planning this big event on October 15th. My impression was you already had the uh, audio system set up before it came. <laughs> I also, there's one other detail I came here I want to find out. There was political brilliance, um, political brilliance uh, uh, initiated by, I think, virtually everyone at this table, but the most brilliant piece of political uh, innovation was somebody, and I can't remember who, discovered that this entire uh, NIH campus was donated by Mr. and Mrs. Luke Wilson. And they had passed away, but their son was sp tracked down and was living in Rome. And somebody got that son to say, we support the moratorium. <laughs> and I, I want to know who did that. It was astonishing. And we announced it. That's true. We've got some documents about it. Yes, I know. But, but 
May I, Carla? Um, I don't have any idea, but I do know that um, uh, the Wilson family uh, were um, very strong uh, supporters of the New Deal, but in fact, they were far, far to the left of the New Deal as a family. Um, they were very close associates of a uh, well-known radical of the 1930s and 40s, Corliss Lamont, whom some oh, of you yes. may know by name. Um, they were a very wealthy family who owned a great deal of property here and um, donated it. Uh, President Roosevelt did not have a very good idea of what to do with that property. And, and eventually, uh, I think perhaps to some degree on the initiation of the Surgeon General and the Public Health Service in about 1937 or 38, um, they felt that the NIH, which then was down at the um, uh, in in Foggy Bottom, right right near uh, right near the National Academy, in, the, in that little hillside where the um, where the old uh, naval, the Surgeon General, the Navy. I can't remember what they called that, but there was there's a stretch there of naval property. The original NIH labs were there. They were quite crowded. Um, one of my colleagues in Building One at that time, Leon Jacobs, who actually worked there. Uh, said the conditions were not good, and uh, the move to uh, the new donated facility was very much uh, um, uh, anticipated and enjoyed. And then the war began, World War II, and it was delayed. And so the actual move did not occur until the early, uh, early to mid-40s. So it was from the time of the donation, which I think was 1938, um, it, it became quite a long delay, and everyone was very restless because they had been mobilized for war research. Let's have one more comment. We're going on longer than I thought, thought I we would, and then we will take a break. Uh, yeah. Mike. Um, it, I'm, I don't remember, but it might have been me who was in touch with the Wilsons because I had met Mrs. Wilson, the daughter of the founders, who was still living in the, what is it, Building 15, at the time, and who had had meetings at her house having to do with the civil rights struggle in the early 60s, and I had met her at that time. What I wanted to add, though, is about the question of the what was going on with permission. I have here a memo of Dr. Robert Berliner spoke to the Interassembly Council of Scientists on the 25th of November, 1969, and he was questioned about guidelines for which organizations would be approved. And when he was questioned, I'll just go to the end, he said, Dr. Berliner repeated, again stating explicitly that the guidelines primary purpose was to exclude the moratorium committee. And this set of uh, notes on the meeting, I think, is signed by Robert G. Martin. <laughs> Let's take a 10-minute uh, break. I'm glad someone keeps records. <laughs> and then we'll come back and uh, pick up. Thank you. We are setting the stage for the um, legal proceedings that led up to um, Dr. Spock's talk at NIH, and I would like to begin by asking Zona Hostetler um, why, uh, wh why the ACLU decided to get involved with the case, and if would you walk us through the, uh, the case, it, both cases, and um, how it all played out legally. Well, the ACLU uh, is a long, long time defender of free speech, uh, freedom to assemble, and uh, so was a brainer <laughs> to uh, <laughs> represent the moratorium committee. Um, I had myself um, handled an ACLU case just a few months earlier involving uh, an HEW group of employees who invited uh, <laughs> Dr. Uh, who invited Michael Tiger, who is a well-known uh, lawyer, professor, to speak about the draft law and its exemptions and how people might take advantage of those exemptions if they so chose. And uh, 
LBJ himself, the president, called uh, Wilbur Cohen, we are told, we don't have any evidence of that, to say, uh, what do I hear about employees uh, uh, having speech against the draft that you, you must not allow that. And so Wilbur Cohen told the group that they could not invite Mike Tiger. And uh, we went to court uh, for that case. And uh, as with the Spock case, lo lost the case below, but won uh, on summary reversal. As it happened, Mike Tiger had been a clerk to one of the judges in the Court of Appeals mm -hmm. and was very beloved by all the clerks in the court. And when we lost the case below, the clerks came running up to help me carry the papers and sh show me how to file an appeal, um, <laughs> which I had never done before. <laughs> and so we had a little bit of a precedent. Um, and so this case followed soon thereafter. You had to move um, very fast, though, did you not, with well, this case? This ca yes, we, I think I had it all nighter. <laughs> Uh, drafting papers and we we lost again below um, and had to appeal to the Court of Appeals in those days uh, the, our DC Court of Appeals had judges who believe very strongly in the Bill of Rights and in the Constitution and in the right to, to uh, free speech uh, things have changed a bit on a lot of our courts as you all know and intervening years. But I think anyway. we should note on the record, though, that the, the judge that uh, turned you down was John Sirica. It was. Uh, of Watergate fame. He and um, would, as the attorney arguing the case, describe his demeanor in the court, if you will, if you mm -hmm. argued before him. Well, he was very um, dour. <laughs> Uh, he really didn't say much. Um, he knew Joseph Hannon, the uh, prosec the U.S. attorney, who was a very conservative fellow, uh, jovial but very conservative, and uh, and and the U.S. attorney uh, argued, uh, you know, this is unpatriotic. This can't be done. And 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 uh, Judge Sirica nodded his head and scowled. And uh, you could tell that Judge Sirica agreed that this was just not patriotic for government employees to be speaking their minds and speaking against the war. And so in very uh, short order, he just dismissed the case without, there wasn't much uh, comment. Um, so we asked for summary reversal from the Court of Appeals right away, uh, which is somewhat difficult to do. <laughs> Usually, as you know, justice takes a long time to achieve. Uh, and But we had a good panel of judges. And um, so they did summarily reverse. And uh, the day before, I think maybe it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, uh, bef before Dr. Spock was to speak. And I think uh, there was an article in the Post the next day saying, Dr. Spock spoke, but <laughs> is to speak, but I don't have a copy of that anymore. If anyone has it, I would love to have it. Um, any case, then um, we tried uh, thereafter to keep the Spock case alive because there continued to be, uh, throughout government, uh, in the Nixon years, uh, now, uh, because Nixon is president at this point, uh, Intimidation, continuing intimidation of employees. Uh, some em there were stories of employees actually being demoted before their because of their anti-war activities. There was a story in the press of uh, a supervisor going into an employee's office and ripping down a Nixon dartboard. <laughs> um, there were uh, <laughs> stories of. Um, uh, uh, pictures being taken at anti-war meetings, uh, even government, even uh, uh, authorized meetings of uh, government employees on their lunch hour, uh, security people coming in and taking pictures of the of the people who were attending, uh, and asking for membership lists of the organizations. So we tried to keep the Spock case alive to protest this, and it went on for, I guess, a couple of years, well, at least more than a year. 
And in the end, that, was, that case was dismissed because uh, the government point said, look, this case was just, a brought, was just about having <coughs> Dr. Spock speak, and Dr. Spock spoke, the case is over, and ultimately the court agreed that uh, if we wanted, uh, if the employees wanted to protest the intimidation, they would have to bring a new case. So that was the, the follow through to the Spock case. But, you know, we won the, the, the case for, which, for the reason for which it was brought, that is to have Dr. Spock speak. Now, in terms of intimidation at NIH, I don't think there was as much, although the employees can, can probably speak to that better than I. I do remember uh, David Reese sending me a, a, a memo which said, uh, if any employee wants to speak to the press, they have to call us first, meaning the administration. That you're not supposed to be you know, fraternizing with the, the media. And uh, Bob just told me that he, since he was married to a, an employee who worked, marry, married to someone who worked for the Washington Post, he wondered if he was supposed to go home. <laughs> <laughs> David Reese, you are the person who introduced Dr. Spock uh, when the event took place. Um, can you walk us through that day? And I, I got this sense listening to the tape that he must have been late and you had to deal with the crowd and Tell us about that day. Well, many people around the table, I'm sure, could help me reconstruct it, but I'll tell you a few cardinal memories. Um, the suit was filed not only on behalf of us here at NIH and IMH, but also on behalf of downtown agencies and HEW. And in the last minute planning for uh, Dr. Spock to speak here, there was a momentary um, potential glitch because the downtown people wanted to have him speak there first and then come here. Uh, my political instinct was to say no because we had done all the heavy lifting and I wanted this to be his first station uh, because it would attract the press, et cetera, et cetera. But there was something that wasn't quite right about that. We were, had been fellows in in arms and in the end, I don't remember how we reached the decision, but we went along with his speaking downtown first, which he did, which almost certainly was the reason for his delay. Um, I don't know if I can provide any more details in the fairly conspicuous uh, for the record. Um, we collected inside Building One, uh, all of us who were then active, uh, there was, of course, great jubilation when he came. The one detail I remember, which has just stuck with me all these years for some reason, is there was a great wish on behalf of the whole group to kind of boy him out to the crowd, which was waiting in front of Building One. But at the last minute, I pulled his sleeve uh, and held him back while the group went out, and I think to much jubilation and applause, just having been denied the theatrical advantage of having him speak first here in Washington. I wanted everybody here to wait a minute or two, draw their breath, and then let him come out. And uh, so he did come out uh, uh, perhaps two or three minutes after the rest. And uh, I think it, it was such a relief to everybody that this had finally happened that, uh, there, I, as I remember, there was tremendous appreciation uh, of his presence. And how many, how, how many people were uh, on the lawn in front of Building well, One, would you guess? That's <laughs> crowd, crowded. Thousands I would say 50,000 at least. <laughs> 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 crowd yeah. estimates were a great game then, and they yes. still are. Uh, there were a lot. I have a couple of photographs from the back of, of, of Spock, uh, so there we could apply a little science to it, but there certainly were a couple of thousand, I would say, and more. One of, the points I made, so Hostet, one of the points I made in the case was that 500 employees had signed a petition for Dr. Spock to mm. speak after it had been, uh, after the administration had said he could not speak. And that was within, the, I don't know, 24, 48 hours. Uh, Irene Elfie? Uh, I just wanted to say that I went to hear Zona present. 
in, in court. I think I was the only one there. I was working part time, so there was no problem with that, and she was just terrific. So I don't want that to go unsaid. My memory of October 14th is I was teaching a seminar at um, St. Elizabeth's Hospital for psychology interns there, and somebody came in bringing me a note and put it in front of me, and all it said was, we won, David. <laughs> <laughs> One anecdote I think happened, I might have dreamed it, uh, John Zinner, Carl, you can maybe recall, and that is either before or after Spock spoke, a number of us had an informal meeting with Dr. Marston and Dr. Spock, and I just remember uh, being a sailor myself, enjoying them sharing their mutual interest in <laughs> sailing. And I think Dr. Spock was talking about his, how his boat had gone aground uh, in the Caribbean, and Dr. Morrison was sympathizing with him. I think, do you recall any of that taking place? So then he was very cordial. I mean, it was obvious where Dr. Morrison's sentiments were at that time. I might add one more um, uh, specific about NIH employees uh, in the aftermath of Dr. Spock. I have an article um, from the Washington Joseph Young, I don't know if it's the Washington Star or the Washington Post, but it, um, it refers to Congressman David Henderson, Democrat of North Carolina, chair of the House Civil Service Manpower Subcommittee, saying that it may be necessary for his committee in Congress to establish legislative guidelines as to what government employees may and may not do. And he, Congressman Henderson inserted in the congressional record our column, meaning the federal spotlight, that is the Washington Post, I think, column by Joseph Young. No, it says Star, Staff Writer. I just see that, Washington Star. Congressman yeah, Henderson. Henderson inserted in the congressional record our column detailing the scathing personal criticism and ridicule of Nixon made by some National Institute of Health employees. <laughs> Bob Ryder, I, I thought David was talking about this milling around of everybody before Spock came out and spoke, and uh, just as a minor sidelight of that, I had my two children there. He patted them both on the head and pronounced them in perfect health. <laughs> and by the end of the afternoon, they both had fevers of 104. <laughs> Any other comments on that particular uh, rally before we move on? Stephanie Weldon. My recollection is that I think David had said that the legal um, costs were quite considerable and we had asked people in the audience to um, help us reimburse the ACLU. And I recall being sent down into the crowd uh, to collect money and people were just throwing money and checks at me, an experience I have not repeated. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say we had collected something like $6,000 wow. in, in a matter of about half an hour. So it did show, I think, uh, the emotional um, appeal of what we had done. And I think it was also a, a good way to kind of kickstart what might never have happened had um, the administration not been so obliging and denied us access to the Clinical Center Auditorium. That, that must have been an effort to, to support the ACLU because the, the cost would have been only the filing fee and the um, Xeroxing. But Stephanie Weldon, we didn't set a, a ceiling, we just said help us and yeah. we were totally I mean, astonished probably with would the have response. Been just a, hundred dollars, two hundred dollars at most. So it must have been that everyone just, you know, felt the need to, to support the ACLU for doing this. So. Uh, it's Elliot Schiffman. Concerning uh, uh, Dr. Marston's uh, <coughs> appearance at the Dr. Spock uh, appearance, uh, sometime later Dr. Marston and I met uh, said that uh, he remembers that very clearly because he was in Scotland or someplace at the time and uh, he was notified uh, very by a frantic uh, 
member of his staff, that Dr. Spock was coming and he ought to be on the campus because this individual is uh, probably going to cause a lot of, of, uh, of problems. And uh, Dr. Marston, when I spoke to him, said that that was not the case at all and he didn't see why he had to be uh, rushed back from uh, uh, England, although he did enjoy the, uh, the uh, Dr. Spock's presentation. I'd like to get a little bit uh, of context now. Uh, first, I'd like somebody to comment perhaps about uh, employees at NIH who did not agree with you. Uh, was there very much among the scientists, among the other staff? Uh, what form did this take? Would somebody speak to that? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, uh, Mark Leventhal, yeah, I'd like to, uh, one aspect, um, was that uh, senior administrators at the in the science in the intramural branch were very concerned, who were sympathetic to an anti-war protest, I think, were very concerned about NIH's appropriation uh, in Congress uh, with regard to all this bad publicity we were. Uh, uh, giving the NIH, and, and uh, I know uh, uh, at one time, there was one incident when a, uh, 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 the um, uh, director of uh, our institute, a person who I would never see, came to my laboratory to lecture me about what I was doing to the uh, intramural program and how it was going to fare in Congress. So that was. Yeah, it came to my lab. Whedon? Uh, uh, no, not oh. Whedon. Um, Probably Ed. Hmm? Probably Ed. Yes, Ed Roll. I don't remember what his position was, yeah, but it was uh, pretty high. Yeah. Uh, uh, Marty Blumsack. Um, the, the, we had posters torn off our walls. Now, Stephanie and I, I don't know. And uh, Kathy Moore, who was the secretary, we were we were in the administrative part, the extramural part of NIH, where there were many, many more individuals whose backgrounds were not on campuses, coming out of tradition of academic freedom necessarily. There was a conveyor of people coming and leaving NIH in the labs, so that identity, you could tell the people from the labs called it the campus and the people in Building 31 called it the reservation because <laughs> technically it was a federal reservation. And I remember being one of the only two people who ate lunch in Building 31 without a jacket on, you know, in my shirt <laughs> sleeves. Um, so yeah, there were a lot of people who were unhappy. Uh, I think Stephanie had some vandalism also. Um, and my memory is, and it may have been Kathy Moore, that in fact uh, retribution was taken against one or more people in the committee, and the committee got together as a group uh, to fight it. Was it Kathy? Stephanie Weldon, it was Kathy. It was Kathy, and I remember it was Bob Goldberger uh, who led that fight, if you will, and said, if anything happens to any of these vulnerable people, we pledge our salaries to support them. This is all coming back yeah. out of the dim recesses of my memory, but Bob Goldberger, I think, was the most vocal on that. Yeah, we made it clear that they were not dealing with just a person here or a person there. They would have to deal with all of us. Bob, uh, Bob Martin. Uh, it wasn't just um, retribution. It wasn't, there were lower, uh, the guy who came through every night and checked that our refrigerators, our, our cold rooms were working, uh, routinely pulled down the uh, signs. Every, er, every other night, he would, we knew which nights he was on because the sign would go up and then the, si the sign would go up the following day and finally we, we uh, it took us a while, but we finally figured out a way that he couldn't tear it down and then he just started writing dirty work. But there was no it. sabotage of your science. No, no, no. This was this was this was a night watchman who was who was angry with us. Popular. Um I, I think it's probably fair to say that there was a lot of bad behavior and also some opposition that was not necessarily bad behavior. For example, there was somebody who followed me around while I was putting up signs in building ten. I would put it up, he would tear it down. I would put another one up, he would tear it down. 
And there was somebody who went to my office, uh, brought, bringing along a photographer who took pictures of my office, specializing in photos of the posters I had on the wall. Um, and uh, they said they were doing this because they were thinking of redecorating. <laughs> that was pretty plausible. <laughs> um, redecorating and building 15K, I mean, really. Um, on the other hand, there were people who were not opposed to the war, in fact, who were in favor of it, who were not necessarily nuts, such as uh, my branch chief, who really believed that if we pulled out of Vietnam, there would be a, a huge massacre and a whole lot of people would be killed by the communists and that our troops there were saving people's lives. Now, you might think this is sort of a peculiar attitude and it might be wrong, but it's not, uh, but it's not crazy. It's just people who you believe. John Zinner, I submitted uh, to you a, a letter that I wrote to Zona. Uh, one of the items in the letter had to do with uh, acts of harassment against uh, female employees who were distributing leaflets. We would distribute leaflets outside of the cafeteria. And these were, uh, this was in particular an NIH security guard who would hover over the leafleteers and uh, people who were going into the cafeteria, which represented, you know, the full spectrum of employees there were, some of them were shouting, go back to Moscow, and making kind of uh, veiled threats for physical harm, but I don't know of any instance where that harm, physical harm took place. There was a shoving contest, I think, at one point down there. At one H more comment, and then I've, we've got a long list and half an hour. At HEW, they were taking pictures of employees who gathered for uh, meetings or to hear speakers. That takes me to my next question, and let's try to limit these to minute uh, group answers if we can, just so we can get through some more before we have to stop. Um, I would like to put this in the context of uh, other groups. Some of you have already talked about the other groups in the government. Uh, what other agencies were organizing? Were there any? Uh, why, was, why was NIH the, the locus of this kind of activity and other agencies not? Uh, who can tell me how it all fits together? Um, Madeline Gold. Actually, the locus, I would say, I mean, NIH and IMH was very active, but it was by no means the, um, the only or the locus of activity. I mean, there was a lot of activity going on all over the government, although HEW, that is downtown HEW and NIH, NIH and NIMH were, were very, very active, and a lot of the key organizers, I think, in the federal employee movement in general around the war in Vietnam came out of HEW. But the reason why? Um, yeah, well, that's Academic. a good question. I mean, when I think about, um, well, l let, me, let me go back to, you know, in 1968 when uh, the federal employees against the war in Vietnam started with this petition drive, and I have that here. Which, is, um, which was a petition that was collecting names from all over the federal government. But the organizers, um, although I was one of the, one of the organizers of it, the, when I look at the sort of the four names that are listed here um, as the officers of it were from different federal agencies, um, although I think at that time three of them, three of the four, Maybe we're at, we're at HEW, and then was, I can't exactly remember where they all came from, but um, it's hard to say. I think that I think HEW attracted a lot of people who were committed to social programs, and um, and commit to doing things that were important, improving people's lives, and um, and so I think that that was a very much of a a sentiment and a the ground the groundwork was laid for people who really then um, could see that. Not only was the war something that was abhorrent to them, but really, as it turned out in terms of a lot of things that we ultimately did in HEW, was we addressed a lot of issues around the, um, the inability of the of HEW to really, we saw, as meet the needs of people in so many areas. And so that became a major area of, of criticism and critique. I mean, we had the advocate, which was 
a newspaper that was printed for five years, and I have <coughs> multiple copies here, but um, which began in 68 and, um, and really what addressed the issues of the, um, of the programs that we felt were not meeting the true needs of the constituents that they were aimed to meet. And, you know, so I think that HEW was very much, you know, a hotbed of, of activism. But there were activists that were in every, just a multitude of federal agencies. And there were people who signed this petition in 68 who were from the Department of State, from aid, and, um, and they were specifically prohibited from um, signing anything that would be publicly address a critique of foreign policy on areas where they were working. And some of them lost their jobs, and they knew this. Um, I mean, they took that, they took that risk. And, uh, but this was an education itself, because people said, I can't sign. You know, it goes against the Hatch Act. And we had to, it was a whole education process to tell people, you are perfectly within your rights to sign this uh, in terms of a, a policy issue. Um, and that that is not what the Hatch Act was about. But, it, you know, overcoming fears, tremendous amount of fears. But there was um, some of the agencies I read before, Labor Department, HUD, Bureau of Census, um, you know, there is hardly any agency that didn't have some degree of activists who were involved in the anti-war movement in the federal government. Uh, Bob Martin, um, in, Marty's already made reference to the difference in referring to the NIH as a campus versus a reservation. And an aphorism of the time was, is NIH the first government institution or the last campus uh, to come on board? Zona Hostetler, following up on Madeline's uh, comments, uh, an article just the month after the Spock case in the Evening Star refers to the fact that lots of government agencies are uh, active in anti-war activities and that the general administration has published a new order tightening rules governing the use of government facilities and the posting of notices. Uh, and then the article says the new limitations uh, appear to be contrary to a court ruling, one recently, <laughs> meaning the month before, um, and uh, Senator Sam Irvin, of Wa also of Watergate fame, fired off his second blast of the week of the week at federal officials on the monitoring of employee activities. He wrote Veterans Administration Donald Johnson expressing concern about reports that Johnson had directed officials to report on employee participation in anti-war activities. And, he, and Senator Irvin said, what civic affairs citizens choose to engage in on their own time is not the business of government. In, they kept trying. I have here in my own handwriting an excerpt from the Federal Register from, you know, the Federal Register, Chapter 101, Subchapter D, Part 101 to 119.307A. Quote, the distribution of materials such as pamphlets, handbills, and flyers is prohibited without prior approval of an authorized official of the agency occupying the space where the material is to be distributed. That was November of 69. Uh, Bob White, uh, I talked with uh, Elliot uh, Shipman about, I think, the Assembly of Scientists. Is that right? Some of us went to them uh, with them, met with them when we were talking about it, and they were talking about it too, and supporting us. And one member, I forget his name, really was just right with us. Let's move on and talk briefly about the rainbow sign. Um, I have read uh, as many copies as you all gave me. I, I don't have the first copy, so I hope we will add this to um, the first issue to the archive. Um, but I have a list of a number of names of people who were uh, on the editorial staff, and I would like to hear from you all. Uh, why did you decide to go to all the trouble of publishing uh, this newsletter, and uh, tell me how it all evolved? Some of you were on the editorial board. Maybe I should. Maybe I should talk to that because I was sort of the co coordinator of the editorial board. 
and uh, I don't really remember whose idea it was to put out a newspaper, but it happened, and the first issue was in December of 1969, and it continued intermittently through 1973, and even in 1974 there were a couple of satirical ones. I think this is the final one that I recall, August 9th, 1974, with the headline, Ryder Leaves NIMH, <laughs> and whoa, whoa. it says, Robert G. Ryder, PhD, well-known raconteur, bon vivant, and member of the Vietnam Moratorium <laughs> Committee, is leaving to accept the position of Chairman, Department of Extra Nuclear Family Development and Planning at the University of Connecticut. And then very down at the bottom in fine print, it says, also in the news, Richard Milhouse Nixon resigns presidency <laughs> under threat of impeachment. <laughs> there, <laughs> there also was an infamous one for which we got a lot of flack and which was probably my fault because I put it in was this rainbow sign from July of 1970. I was going to ask about this one. And in the, in the bottom of the first page was a picture from some demonstration down on the mall, which one of the demonstrators has a sign saying, pull out, Nixon, like your father should have done. <laughs> Now that's a provocative thing to do, to decide to put on the front page. Why did you decide to put that instead of any a number of other ones? Um, what, was this just because you were so frustrated and you were going to do it, or was there any other reason? I guess I thought it was funny, and not being uh, not thinking very far ahead, I didn't think much past that. I have to say, Carl, this this incident caused me a memorable and anguished experience. Um, I was uh, called uh, as in the very role that I had been playing for at that point, uh, I guess a year and a half, uh, down to the department uh, to meet with um, some senior, um, whatever you call them, secretary level people. Um, a number of them are uh, people who have uh, continued to have a good deal of fame, uh, both originally in the Nixon administration and later uh, in um, capitalist America. Uh, one of them was uh, Frank Carlucci, who was, uh, I think at that time, the undersecretary of HEW, briefly before he went to the Defense Department. And another was a notable uh, Washington uh, industrialist and financier, a man named Fred Malik, whom I think many of you have run into, who's uh, pr one of the pr people proposing to buy uh, the baseball team. Um, they wanted to know whether I knew the person who was pictured in that picture and what were we at NIH planning to do about it. Um, and I said, no, I really don't have any idea who he was. He's sitting across the table from me at the moment, I think. And, um, and I did not intend to do anything about it because we didn't even know who it was. And um, that was the answer, but I kind of sweated under something of a third degree at that time. Um, I came back and told the director of NIH what had happened, and he patted me on the back, and he said, I'm glad you got through it all right, and it, I did. And it was uh, just one of those memories, but it was a, a strong experience. This particular episode was one that um, made some powers that be very, very distressed and very angry, and um, I think we, um, created a little bit of a protective barrier in that. Uh, this, this is what I wanted to read and then let you all respond uh, to it was the, um, I mean, that it really did. It made it to the floor of the Congress of uh, the House of Representatives. Um, it, it was a Representative William J. Sherrill, a Republican from Iowa, who uh, was not amused and um, 
He cited all of you all on the floor of the House as a group of malicious maligners who published a despicable newsletter entitled Rainbow Sign. This vicious rag prints extremely <laughs> repugnant personal attacks against President Nixon as well as criticism of his domestic and foreign policies. And then he cites this particular uh, issue. He also named names in this. Uh, and salaries. Um, I will read the names, but not the salaries at this point. Uh, that would be funny. I, I, that would be funny. <laughs> no, I just didn't record them for the for this particular thing. Um, and I I would love to hear from those of you whose names are in this list as to whether you had any fallout. Also, Bob Dworkin, microbiologist. Bob Lesser, PHS commissioned officer. Mike Mage, PHS commissioned officer. Kathy Moore, Secretary, Phil Ross, Research Chemist, Bob Ryder, Chief, Section of Family Development, NIMH, Dorothy Stewart, Secretary. Um, anybody care to comment? Enter into the record. I do have, courtesy of Irene, a copy of, of, um, of Marston's um, uh, memo of rebuke for this incident. So I guess he must have felt uh, he had to go on record for rebuke. And I also have a couple of uh, um, news articles on Cheryl, um, again, courtesy of Irene, on this incident. Uh, two, two, uh, two things. One is I, I, I had the impression that we probably picked up more flack for the issue in which we did an employee evaluation of Nixon this that one. was the same issue, I believe. Oh, that was a good issue. It was a different issue. That was, <laughs> that, was a, that was a winner, that issue. And the other thing was to express my personal regret that Kathy Moore apparently has not been located and doesn't seem to be here because she, uh, while we all worked on the rainbow sign, she was very, very much into very it. Active. Very active. And um, her last known phone number was canceled out. I spoke with Kathy. John Zenner, I spoke with Kathy Moore. Uh, Elliot, I think. Who? Elliot found her, and she is uh, up in Pennsylvania and would have liked to attend and sends her best regards to everyone, but uh, she was concerned about the drive down here, particularly having to go across the mountains and concerned about the snow, so she wasn't going to be able to attend, but wishes that she could have. I'd like to comment that in the following issue, we published two critical letters and comments on the incident, and one of the letters uh, said, there's some sort of a low and gut gutter level vulgarity and things like that. So we published, one letter was from John Pisano, the other was from John Small, who I don't remember who he was. And then we had our own comments. Uh, the criticism of poor judgment is a serious one which we are evaluating. The criticism of poor taste is a personal literary opinion to which each person is entitled. <laughs> I, I am interested in this because of the uh, escalating rhetoric that was going on in this period throughout the country, uh, escalating to the left, because in the 80s and the 90s it starts to escalate to the right, and it has fallout at any time on civil discourse. And uh, I just wonder if anybody had any commentary on, uh, was it just freewheeling or uh, were people very aware that it was in your face and that's the way it needed to be? Uh, Phil Ross, uh, I'd just like to say in defense of the rainbow sign, there were many thoughtful articles and uh, my participation uh, was point of view of educating the people to whom it was distributed to about what was going on in Vietnam. I recall assembling this list of quotations uh, dating from way back from 1954. Everybody's saying each year that the, the, the corner has been turned and it's all going to be over and it's successful and so on going <laughs> year after year. Uh, but anyway, coming back to the uh, cartoon and the uh, rainbow sign, I was called in uh, to Dr. Rawls' office. He was the uh, 
uh, head of intramural research in our uh, uh, institute and uh, <coughs> uh, queried uh, as to what I had to do with this thing. I felt he had pressure had come to him uh, to uh, uh, bring me in there and uh, 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 and actually, that, that particular issue I had nothing to do with. I, either I was away or something, but it was in the issue that he asked me, what do you know about it? And I said, well, I, I, I stand up for this committee, and I think we have the right to, to publish any, every, anything. Uh, uh, and, and it's a thing that's always bothered me since then, because I, I myself, I, I didn't particularly care for that uh, uh, cartoon. Uh, but yet I felt the great loyalty to this group to uh, take the rap for it, whatever might have happened. And he, he then told me that he would put an official reprimand into my record, whatever that meant. Uh, yes. uh, Elliot Schiffman, uh, concerning the, uh, the cartoon, uh, yes, that uh, I understand that we uh, lost some points, but as others have stated, that the purpose of the rainbow sign, at least one purpose, was to try to educate the uh, populace uh, <clears throat> at the NIH, and uh, they had uh, uh, summaries of the remarks by a number of speakers, and I thought this was uh, a real uh, <coughs> contribution as far as that's concerned. And finally, what a difference 36 years makes. Uh, something like that appearing now would cause no comment whatsoever. <coughs> I would, we are literally running out of time. And I would like to ask uh, for people to comment on activities after the Spock speech. I know there were Thursday discussion groups. I know there were other speakers. There were other concerts. And uh, I would love to hear um, how these were organized and what all was happening. Audrey Stone, you haven't said anything. You have any comments on this? Uh, well, I was going to comment on the previous. You go ahead, because I go think ahead. that was important. Attorney Stone. Uh, my comment was uh, uh, in response to your previous question. Okay, go ahead. Well, I think that um, I was there, actually, and I was right near where the pole where this young kid was, had climbed and was waving this banner. And I think what it really does show is to get to your point about in your face. It's, it was the youth, the very young uh, people in the country who were doing all sorts of um, outlandish um, uh, means to uh, protest. Their dress was different, their hair was long, their language was you know, very different from what we usually accept and so on, and this was just part of it. So from the reporter's standpoint, that, that could be defended for showing it because it just did give the reason why we have we had such protest of that nature, which is what you asked about. Could I add something really quick to that, this Robert Ryder, which is that uh, I think it's entirely defensible that we did such a rude thing. We were not out to gain points. We were not out to look pretty. We were out to attract attention. And the more attention we attracted, the more people thought about the war and the better off we were. We never tried to look good. We tried to get things done. Mark Leventhal, I'd like to respond to the question that you um, asked. I think there was, uh, from the very inception of the committee, uh, a um, desire to uh, play on our special role as health scientists involved with health to um, emphasize that uh, the uh, war represented a dramatic shift in our priorities from the, uh, from the NIH's perspective of curing diseases and otherwise uh, 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 a culture of life to a culture of death. And, I, and uh, right after and uh, two concrete uh, things. Right after uh, Dr. Spock spoke, right after that, we had uh, uh, Reverend Channing Phillips speak about the, um, specifically 
about uh, how uh, DC was underfunded and the problems of DC. And then another activity that uh, uh, I was involved in was uh, promoting an alternate lifestyle on the NIH campus, which involved uh, concerts we, uh, that I know of. We had three concerts, Pete Seeger, Crank, and another rock group. Yeah, I have one of those right in my office. <laughs> and, um, uh, and the impetus for doing that, it wasn't an anti-war protest per se. It was a protest against the culture of dying and that we felt that the NIH and that HEW should stand for a culture of life. Um, Natalie Reddick, Natasha Reddick. Um, I just wanted to, to comment on something Elliot said earlier. I, I remember a discussion of one of, the, uh, one of the slogans that we did develop, and this follows up on what um, Mark has just said, is being from NIH, NIMH, one of the slogans we had was, this war is unhealthy and insane. Um, and I, I think that was one that we were responsible for. Moving on, I um, uh, just wanted to mention two other organizations. We, we, had, we had meetings monthly every single month from 1968 until the end of the war. Um, we were an extraordinarily dedicated group. Uh, two other uh, activities that emerged from uh, this moratorium committee were the formation of Federal Employees for Peace, which did um, uh, include representatives from other organizations, around uh, other governmental um, entities, and the, the big event of that that group sponsored was to invite Dr. Daniel Ellsberg to receive a, an honorary <laughs> award um, as an as a, uh, exemplary um, civil servant for the, uh, and a model to all. Um, and the other, um, the other um, organization that I was involved in was um, one called the League of Federal Voters, which, which we picked up on from the um, League of Women Voters. And um, this is a one, one of our, um, it, and it was the 1972 um, election, uh, Nixon against McGovern. And uh, our idea was that we could, in uh, various federal agencies, sponsor debates between representatives of the Democratic and um, Republican parties um, to which people would be invited. And this was not in violation of the Hatch Act in any way because it was nonpartisan. And being nonpartisan, there happened to be in that election year in, in Montgomery, in uh, Maryland, and probably also in Virginia, representatives of the Communist Party and the Socialist Party who had gained access to the ballot. And because we had uh, become at that point a recognized employee group and were able to hold meetings in federal offices, we did indeed, and I remember at the Park Lawn Building, um, have a debate wherein there were representatives of the Republican, Democratic, uh, Socialist, and Communist parties speaking in a federal building to federal employees uh, who listened with rapt attention. So I have <laughs> to add to that, that um, my older son, who is now a Montgomery County uh, politician of some consequence, at that time was 10 years old in 1972 or 71, and uh, went up and down our street collecting signatures on a uh, ballot petition for the candidacy of one Dr. Spock. Oh. <laughs> uh, I now oh. um, is it on? Yeah. I want to say a couple things about speakers. Uh, one is the first speaker, and I was very honored to be able to introduce him in the auditorium at the Clinical Center, was I.F. Stone. Uh, oh, the yes. uh, uh, producer of I.F. Yeah. Stone's Weekly, who had actually started writing about Vietnam in 1964, before most people were aware of what was happening. And so he was just, you know, such a wonderful person to have there. The other thing I wanted to mention that both neither Natasha nor I mentioned is that aside from the overall group, we had an additional group in extramural NIMH because we were off we still called it the reservation, I'm sorry. We were not on the reservation. We were first in the Barlow Building and the Park Lawn Building. And one of the things that we did was to have a series on mental health and the war. And so we had people coming to talk about things that were very interesting because the VA wasn't paying attention to it, but we were and unfortunately didn't do any action about it. We were talking about the problems of soldiers coming back. Mm -hmm. We were talking about their families. Uh, one of the speakers that we had we thought was of such general interest that he spoke in the 
auditorium on campus rather than uh, there, and that was Robert J. Lifton. Mm -hmm. So that in addition to the rest of what was happening, and I'll, I'll go back one step with it, when word got around that Dr. Spock was going to be speaking, we called a meeting at the Barlow Building for people who were interested in hearing what was happening, and we had a regular conference room, and they were pouring out into the corridors. There were so many people, we couldn't believe uh, the interest that was generated. I want to add one thing for the record uh, for people who may be listening to this later uh, as to why we are calling this the NIH NIMH group uh, <coughs> simply because uh, the National Institute of Mental Health has been in and out of NIH several times right. and at the moment that this was happening uh, it was technically not a part even though the intramural program was still located on the campus. Yeah, I, I just wanted to document certain things that, um, you know, in, um, in 1970, um, there was a, a lot of the folks who had been involved in, um, in anti-war activities got, got together, including folks from NIH and NIMH, and we, we put together something that was called the Committee on the Rights and Responsibilities of Federal Employees. And, um, and actually, it was you know, all kinds of little, you know, organizations here, but we, we then put together subsequently a convention that we called the um, Federal Employees for Peace, Equality, and Priorities. It was a one-time, you know, con conference that we put together on all kinds of issues, and it wasn't just the war. It was civil rights. It was, um, it was a whole range of domestic issues that um, was of concern, too. And, and that, um, I mean, I think that gave, fueled some of the interest that people were having in terms of beginning to look at trade unions and ta either taking over old, more abundant trade unions in their in their agencies, um, or initiating them, but um, that did move also into into the formation of the Federal Employees for Peace, which was very active. I mean, in addition to the conference, the, the dinner that um, Natasha had talked about, which was attended by like 600 people. I mean, it was a huge, wonderful dinner where we gave um, Daniel Ellsberg also this huge paper mache uh, <laughs> uh, stamp, uh, declassified, de de and it was, it was just great. But we were very active, all of us, in, in Federal Employees for Peace in multiple demonstrations, um, both individual federal employee demonstrations as well as joining other larger demonstrations that were taking place at the time. I wanted to pursue one uh, particular thing uh, as we're drawing to a close. Uh, I came across a reference in March 1970 to an FBI investigation of one Irene Elkin Waskow then. Uh, I'd like to know what was going on, why you were being investigated, what happened, and then uh, perhaps uh, was, if you all have, can say was there anybody else being investigated along with uh, the extramural scientists who were being uh, blacklisted from study sections, I mean university scientists who were being blacklisted. Yes. <laughs> I brought along my fold from the FBI <laughs> investigation. Um, uh, I was investigated in December of 1969. I don't think it's coincidental that I was coordinator that month. Uh, Bob Martin and I actually, and I were uh, co-coordinators. I wanted a co-coordinator on campus because I wasn't on campus and, and somebody had to deal with things that would be done with the administration there. And um, uh, we don't know exactly the reason. I mean, in terms of what they said, they told some people I was applying for a job. They told other people it was an HEW, um, uh, you know, requested investigation, although HEW, we could find nothing. There was no, nobody in the administration knew of it. They simply came in. They talked to my current supervisor, a former supervisor on the NIMH campus, um, and a couple of other people. Uh, they also came to my neighborhood and talked to people in the neighborhood. They asked people about my political views, my husband's political views, et cetera. Um, we did do a memo, and I had forgotten this. Sixteen of us, many of whom are sitting around the table, uh, signed this memo to Dr. Stanley Yolis, the director of NIMH, and I'll just read you the first uh, paragraph. On behalf of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee at NIH, NIMH, we express to you our alarm and dismay that an agent of the FBI was permitted to question the present and former NIMH supervisors of Dr. Wasco. 
The committee regards this investigation as an attempt to intimidate not only Dr. Wasco, but all other NIMH and NIH employees who now or in the future might participate in our activities. And we then requested the director do a number of things in terms of informing uh, the FBI that investigations could not be done without going through HEW, et cetera, et cetera. Those are a list. I'll leave this, a copy of this with you if you would like it. I then came across another thing that we sent in March of, seven, of 1970. This was sent uh, December 23rd, 1969. And it starts by saying, we would like to express our displeasure at not having received a reply to our memorandum <laughs> concerning the FBI investigation of Dr. Irene Wasco. We are strongly convinced of the need for a statement from your office emphasizing the points in our memorandum. I don't believe we ever heard from the director of NIMH because I can't imagine I wouldn't have it in my records and I, because they're pretty good, and I don't have it in my records. And, um, this was obviously of concern to me personally, to concern to all of us, or we wouldn't have, have sent this memo. Um, I am afraid, and this is something people don't like to talk about, but I am afraid that there was probably an informer in our group. Uh, this was not, this was any group that you were involved in that was actively involved in anti-war activities, you knew that there, that could happen. But I began to, believe that that was true in our group as well, which was such a sad sort of thing given the wonderful, I mean, you can tell the wonderful spirit and camaraderie um, of our group. This whole thing stimulated me to, to remember that I've never asked for my FBI file and I will. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it was certainly something that was, I continue to be as active as I have been. Uh, there was one point that I had been called into the divi my division director's office earlier, I believe, because, and we shouldn't have done this, I, uh, my phone number at work was given as a callback number for something. I don't know if it was in the rainbow sign or in something else that we had. And I was simply asked by my division director and my uh, branch chief to not do that again. And I said it had been a mistake. I would not do that again. And we reiterated what uh, the agreement originally was that any time I went to the NIH campus for meetings, I took annual leave. I took, you can't believe how many, I don't think I had any vacations <coughs> because I took a lot of annual leave in order to come over uh, to campus uh, for activities. Aside from that, both my division director and my branch chief said essentially right on. <laughs> Mark, uh, uh, Mark Leventhal, uh, excuse me, Bob. Um, I uh, did get my FBI file and I was investigated by the FBI for espionage in the 19, in 1970, there was an informant in our group because I have the raw data from meetings of ours where, uh, where it was black lined so as not to disclose who the informant is. The FBI subsequent, the uh, NIH Office of Security, I, I should have brought that file, I'm sorry. The NIH Office of Security cooperated in that investigation, uh, and I've forgotten his name, Bino, Benno, something or other, and uh, uh, the FBI agents were on campus and uh, 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 asked a number of people. Uh, like, go ahead. Uh, Bob Martin, uh, I'd never heard either of these stories before. So, and I had always assumed that my incident was because of my wife, not because of myself. <laughs> and now I'm beginning to wonder. At one point, I got a phone call in about this time frame um, from the security office of HEW, not the security office of NIH. And the uh, secretary said, the security officer of HEW wants to meet with you. And I said, security officer of HEW, what's that? And she said, the security officer of HEW. And I said, listen, is, is this just because I've gotten too many parking tickets on the NIH campus, or is this <laughs> bang, bang, guns and robbers? And she, her response was, the security officer of HEW wants to meet with you. Um, so we made in time, I went up to building one, the tape recorder was on, the FBI people were there, and the question had to do with whether I knew any communist diplomats. 
Uh, and the answer was hundreds, because my wife was covering the diplomatic circuit for the uh, Washington Post, and we went to dinner parties almost every night, uh, <laughs> and uh, I immediately knew who they were talking about. It was the former military attaché of the Polish embassy who had gone back a year before and who was a delightful guy and we had only had over the house one time uh, and uh, couldn't find any, um, uh, figured we had to find someone who was immune to that kind of thing, and so we involved, invited a actor of Polish descent, Bob Pratsky, who we knew because my wife and her, his wife had worked together at the Post a million years before. In any case, um, they, uh, after they got done with the interrogation, they said, uh, uh, said, well, you know, please inform us uh, if you uh, uh, ever have any such meetings again uh, uh, with uh, communist things, we want to know before you defect. <laughs> I'd like to add that I think, given the history of the times, there's probably none of us who was not investigated by the FBI at some time or other. I know <laughs> that my first boss at NIH actually told me that the FBI had come into his office and asked him about me. You're mentioning Stanley Yalis, uh, jogs my memory. His wife, Tamara Yalis, was an administrator in the public health service who at one time called me in and had me on the carpet for criticizing the government. And I believe I still have in my file somewhere an official letter of reprimand from the Surgeon General for using the facilities of the government to criticize the government. <laughs> Uh, to, to Robert Ryder, there are two things that, that I want to comment on. Well, there have been a couple of allusions here to there being other groups, but I think that while we often use different names for different things, there were t uh, two other kinds of groups that we were all at a loose coalition with. There was this anti-racist group that we were involved with and that we were look, sort of fellow, I bet I better not use the word traveler, shall I? Uh, and the other one was the federal empl uh, Federally Employed Women, which is easy to remember because I love the acronym, FEW. <laughs> it was really good. Uh, the other thing is that we had a lot of fun over the idea of there being spies in and around us. There always were. I remember some poor guy who wound up on trial someplace discovering that he'd been at a meeting in which he was the only one who wasn't there on the payroll of some <laughs> investigative body or other. And it was a very pleasant thing when there was a demonstration to be had and the weather was really bad. It would be raining, it would be sleeting or something. So we would all stay home. But these poor bastards had to go. <laughs> I remember in 1982, I was um, about to become general counsel at the Naval Research Laboratory. And I had to get, um, I think it was a Q clearance, atomic energy clearance. And someone from the FBI came to interview me. And his comment was, wow, do you have a file? <laughs> <laughs> he said, it is really fun to read. And I had never bothered to, I still haven't, but I think now I keep saying I'm going to do it. But, but the, the bottom line, of course, was it was all public, or as you know, we lawyers like to say, open and notorious. And so there was nothing blackmailable. And I got the Q clearance um, you know, and became the general counsel there. But um, yeah, I, we were really spied on. <laughs> I'm going to bring this to a close because I know some of you have a 2.30 uh, commitment. Um, I, there are lots of other things we could talk about, although I think you all have hit, I mean, the, the spirit of this group has clearly been recorded in this um, <laughs> uh, conversation. Um, I will have one more question for you, and then we will call it a day. Uh, what was the long-term effect of this group on the NIH, on you personally, and have your children become activists? Comments? I had, uh, uh, one of the things that I always used to say when people said, why are you doing this, was that someday my grandchildren are gonna ask me, what were you doing then? And I would like to have something to say. You know, my grandchildren could care less. <laughs> <laughs> They're mostly interested in rock music and they have no no concern whatsoever about what happened in Vietnam. It's a very great disappointment. May I ask a question, if you're closing, that I would like to hear? 
while people comment on your question, perhaps they could comment on mine too. In particular, those people who are still closely associated with NIH or know the organization in 2005. And it's a simple question, and that is, why is there not an NIH Iraq moratorium committee? Yes. John, I'm not in NIH any longer. My thought is that the draft had a lot to do with it, that uh, now we can, the, the people who are at risk, the young people who are at risk are people who are more on the margins of society. And uh, the, the people who are in power and the people who have uh, are at a high economic standing and have a lot of influence just aren't at risk and their families aren't at risk. And I think that was one of the important motivating factors uh, here at that era. I think that if there was a draft now, first of all, I don't think there'd be an Iraq war, but if there was a war and there was a draft, I think there'd be just that same activity, my guess is. Uh, I'd like to add to both questions. Uh, my uh, youngest child uh, was two when Pete Seeger uh, sang. She still remembers it. She's very politically active and she's a history student. Um, to, to answer your other question, Carl, uh, the demography is very different here now. I'm still an acting researcher at NIH, and I've been here since 1963. Uh, I, in my laboratory at the moment, uh, there's only one American-born uh, person, and she's a staff employee. They're, everybody is uh, from some foreign country, all the postdocs and, and even some of the staff members. Uh, so. Uh, there isn't as large a group of physicians and uh, postdocs as there used to be who uh, are politically involved, and part of this is the demography, I think. My children, Stephanie Weldon, um, my daughter just turned 22 yesterday, my son will be 19 next week, and I remember a story. Uh, when my daughter was in fourth grade, my son was in kindergarten, and this was uh, when Bill Clinton and Al Gore were first running for president and vice president. My daughter said to her brother, Simon, are you voting for me for vice president of the student government? And this kindergartner looked at her and said, I can't, Hillary. I have to vote for Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> so they remain very politically active. John Zinner, uh, my two older children marched. You're not oh, I'm sorry. Don't John Zinner, my two older children uh, marched in our uh, in those demonstrations, and they were heavily <laughs> affected by it. Uh, all of my kids and their spouses are activists. I like to say that they're all nonprofit, and uh, they're all involved in public interest activities and things like that. And, and I, I think it came out of the culture of our family at that time and our friends as well. I'd like to say. I'd like to say that the same is true in my family. My three children are all activists to varying degrees. And in fact, we have three generations of, of stones marching in these anti-Iraq war demonstrations. And I'm still marching. I'm waiting to see the younger generation come up and take my place. But at this point, it's still our obligation. Mark Leventhal. Um, both of my children are socially active, and I have a great photograph from the uh, front page of the Purdue Exponent when uh, 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 Peter was there of him and I leading a uh, normal protest <laughs> across the Purdue campus. Uh, Bob Martin, the more directly to answer your question, I think the immediate effect upon the NIH was uh, so an awareness of social consciousness on all kinds of records, on all kinds of issues, uh, which followed up so that the, uh, um, uh, the a protest that I organized against the, the, the Nixon's uh, uh, Cancer Institute being separated from the NIH and organized a bunch of uh, things like that. There were a number of issues that came up. That, as I mentioned before, the, uh, uh, the upward mobility program that we all began. The answer to Carl's question uh, is is much. I agree entirely with Rose. Is that the, the the composure uh, and the dem dem demographics of the NIH have changed and. Uh, you might ask the same question about why is there not the response 
with regard to stem cell research here at the NIH uh, in the same way as the Iraq war? And the answer is both of those have, uh, no one at the NIH has taken the, you know, the responsibility to do it. And some of them are too old. helped uh, organize a group called Children Against the War back then, and they're both still activists, and my, my son works for Friends of the Earth. Uh, my daughter's a pediatrician, but she recently took her daughter on a, pe her five-year-old on a peace vigil, and I then took the five-year-old granddaughter, she wanted to go with me on a peace vigil, and uh, her comment was, uh, uh, Grandma, kids know that you're not supposed to fight, but you're supposed to work things out with words. Why don't grown-ups know that? <laughs> <laughs> My own activities have ended up being more recently towards electoral politics, because I think it's so important now. You probably won't be surprised to know that I worked on the primary campaign of Barack Obama before people had heard about him. <laughs> uh, my two sons uh, both had hair like uh, mine. It was long to make a statement, and uh, so both of them had it. They were in ju junior high school and high school, so they had that long hair, until my youngest son, who is the one here, Andrew Cheney White, had been getting all the emails from me. Uh, he went in the Navy immediately, and they gave him such a rough time when he graduated out in San Diego, and I went out there and still had my long hair. They didn't really want me on the reservation, but they finally <laughs> had to, because I said, I'm going to talk to the chaplain. So they let me go, but it scowled at me. It was a corp or something like that. But anyway, my son now, uh, he still understands, and he read most of it. I have a big, thick thing of email, and he read most of them, and he now works with IMF, and he's really got a, a broader view of what's going on in the world. Yes, sir. Uh, Elliot Schiffman, you asked about uh, some of the either impediments or the lack of interest as far as having a, uh, <clears throat> a moratorium committee about the Iraq war. I recently tried to do something along those lines uh, because my wife and I were members of a group, uh, Montgomery County Bill of Rights Committee, uh, concerned about uh, getting uh, <clears throat> some uh, revisitation about the Patriot Act. And I called one of the NIH uh, uh, people who was in charge of grounds, as it were, and told them that I wanted to put some table tents out, uh, which uh, were a uh, invitation to attend a meeting off campus about uh, people who were going to be discussing the Patriot Act. And I was told that it was completely uh, unauthorized uh, to do something like this, but the individual could not st uh, stop me from putting a little uh, notice on the bulletin board where all the uh, people are uh, advertising uh, their houses or cars and so forth. So there's been a change, apparently, on uh, the administration as far as allowing uh, <coughs> uh, political activities. And presumably this was nonpartisan, too, but that didn't make any difference. One final statement. Go ahead. I want to make the last statement. Okay. Uh, Marty Blumsack. I, I'm still here, here at NIH. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what's changed. Part of what happened is, I think we mentioned before, is there was a long tradition of activism. A lot of people who were uh, opposing the war, many of us came out of a tradition where we had organized before. We kind of knew how to do it and what to do. We brought a lot of people who didn't know along with us. There was a lot more time to organize against the war in Vietnam. A lot of people who came in our committee, they were reluctant to attend a meeting at all in the beginning and after several years, they were yelling down on the mall. Um, what's happening now is they, we have such short wars, it's very difficult, uh, I think, in some cases to get organized. Um, I don't know what's going on with the culture. Uh, my daughter, Sarah, when she was five, um, I have a picture of her with a purple sash uh, at the front of the Equal Rights Amendment march. Uh, she is very independent. She questions authority, but s doesn't seem to have the same sort of attitude towards pol uh, political figures and the administration. And I think also what's happened is uh, the population's gotten dumb. And they don't want to have to admit that the people who they elect 
uh, it's the same old thing, which is if you admit they're wrong, then you have to take care of it. And it's easier just to pretend that they know better. Um, or in other words, yeah, I don't know what's, what the reason is. I do know that, uh, I mean, I have, most of my time now is spent doing uh, volunteer mediation. I'm, I'm not out on the line anymore. After we finished in 76, I helped organize an international hookers convention down in D.C., much to the pleasure of Leon Jacobs, the deputy director of NIH, who when I came back, he went, hey, hey, you know. <laughs> so, so uh, and then, then I got into just boards and commissions. And I don't know, I, I feel sometimes I just trailed off. <coughs> uh, maybe the answer is it's because we're not doing it, and then why the hell don't we do it? And maybe what, what we need to do is, okay, we, we've been away from it for a while. Maybe it's time to get back. Some of us haven't left, but to the rest of us who, some of us definitely haven't left. And maybe the problem with the rest of us is we've just lost a sense of community that we once had. The whole culture is so disparate and spread out. But uh, I think some of us have to respond to the call. It's not meant to be a final statement. Well, I, I think it's perhaps a very good final statement, though, because it, it leaves uh, it the future time. open for uh, all sorts of possibilities. And uh, I will thank you all for coming and participating. Uh, we'll be making a transcript of this, and um, if you'd like to see it or whatever, we will be uh, happy to make it available to you. And please um, stay in touch with Brooke for donations or things we need to copy and get back to you. Um, uh, unanimous consent to revise and extend. Uh, <laughs> you have, the, the gentleman is recognized for two more minutes. Are we going to also, um, we have access to the video um, since we're, I mean, I think a lot of us would be really interested in, in having both the written as well as the video, um, as well I, as the photographs. We should be able to do this. And the photographs uh, too. And yeah, maybe. oh yeah, we, we'll yeah. have, uh, we're, we're gathering all this together and uh, we should be able to make copies for people. I can maintain our email list, and then if you communicate with me or your group does, I can get any kind of information out or requests out to the rest. I, I want to apologize to the group for having to rush the ending of this meeting because we could have gone on, but I, I think I've, um, I've gone as far as I could go with Jacques at Café okay. Europa, and he's sort of set a limit of when we can get there and have our own reunion. And, uh, you know, I, I had to ask Vicky if we could stop at 2 so we could get there around 2.30. Otherwise, uh, we're kind of stuck. They have everything waiting for us, and other parties are going to be coming to take the room after. I move that we extend a warm uh, thanks to Vicky for hosting this event and for being willing to consider it of historical interest. Right. I guarantee you it will be of historical interest. I can see a dissertation coming out of it. <laughs> I'd like to move that we uh, elect uh, John Zinner coordinator for life. <laughs> Thank you all. Hi, uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, the, the rainbow sign, it meant so much. My daughter wanted to do something for me when she was a high school senior. And I said, make me a stole as a minister that's a rainbow stole, and I've worn it ever since. <laughs>